Hi. Cool. Um, it's nice to be here. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm a little groggy this morning. I see some groggy faces out there too, so we're in this together. Um, so this morning, I, I thought I'd just take the piss out of how complicated it is to make websites rather than like show you very much of my work. I thought that would be a little bit more fun. Uh, but before I get into that, let me start with a story and by being a little meta. Um, this is a picture of me giving a talk. Uh, it looks like I'm doing stand-up, but it's just like another event kind of like this. Um, this was in Norway over the summer, and the um, talk went pretty well, so after I wrapped up, I kind of stepped off the little stage that they had, and I got into a really nice conversation with uh, a young digital designer. Um, we were having fun comparing like the status of our two careers. So me, I had 15 years of experience making websites. Uh, she was just getting started, so she had one year of experience. And oddly enough, uh, we were both in the same place. So we enjoyed the work, but we were both sort of confused and overwhelmed by the complexity of everything. So 15 years of work sort of felt like one year of work. Um, and that was sort of a shock to both of us. We're like, oh, wow, OK, this is sort of unusual. Um, we felt a little bit better because it seemed like we were confessing something that you're not supposed to say. You're supposed to act like you know everything after one year. You're supposed to act like you know even more than that after 15. But I was sort of like, I feel kind of like clueless most of the time. So uh, today, I want to try to like extend that conversation a little bit and talk about what's so confusing about making websites in 2017. And uh, if you're overwhelmed out there, maybe make you feel a bit better in the process as well. During that conversation, um, that young designer, she asked me if I had any advice for her based on my 15 years of experience that apparently weren't very worthwhile. I told her that there was sort of three things that I thought she needed to keep in mind uh, as she worked through her career. Because as she was out there, uh, the industry, it was going to try to persuade her into working and thinking in certain ways that I've never really found very fruitful. Uh, this is what I told her. I said, go slow, be clear, and stick with it. This was meant to be a reminder against speed, against unnecessary complexity, and um, against change for change's sake. So go slow, be clear, stick with it. Um, this is the most important idea in this whole talk. I put it at the beginning so you can just remember this, and then the rest you can just zone out, take it or leave it, whatever you want to do. Now, one cause of my confusion uh, was because I've been away from the web for a little while. Um, three years ago, I stopped making websites for clients and decided to focus on a software company that I co-founded called Abstract. Um, I wrapped up my work there at the beginning of last year, and after a little bit of time off, I decided to reopen the design studio I had been running before I co-founded that company. And wouldn't you know, the first few jobs through the door were web projects. Now, three years, it's like a really long time whenever it comes to techniques about making websites. I figured that my knowledge would be pretty dated, so it needed some updating. And I started to investigate some of the latest developments, and whew, oh my, things have gotten like really gnarly and complicated in the last few years, haven't they? Now, at first, that complexity was pretty off-putting to me. Um, I wondered if I even wanted to tackle these web projects, seeing the current working methods. But my gut, it told me that a lot of that complexity was completely optional. So the new complexities and workflows and tool chains and implementation details, you don't need to do all of that. You can, it may be useful, but it's optional. Um, so today I want to put some words around my concerns, my concerns around that complexity. And make a small defense for simple design and simple implementation as a viable and better option for us and the web itself. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. First, I should tell you a little bit more about who I am and what the hell I do and where I come from. Um, my name is Frank. I'm a designer. Uh, I'm a designer who writes, more specifically. I live on a little island off the coast of America in a place called New York City. We don't claim America anymore. 
And there I run a boutique design studio, which is just a pretentious way of saying that it's like tiny with a capital T. Clients seem to like this for some reason. I don't know why. So we've been able to do all kinds of work. Um, we design books, make magazines. There it is. Cool. Uh, we design brands for our clients. Um, we make apps. This is Abstract, the software company I co-founded. And uh, yeah, of course, we make websites. So I thought a monkey in a spacesuit would kind of improve this presentation a little bit. So there we go. Now, this year, it's a bit of an anniversary for me. Uh, the studio is celebrating 15 years in business, and I'm celebrating 20 years of making websites. And like any big anniversary, you start to remember how things got started. So for the studio, uh, it started back in 2002 as a man. That's me, uh, with a laptop and a stack of paper at a desk in the corner of his apartment. And now, about 15 years later, in 2018, the studio is still a man with a laptop and a stack of paper at a desk in the corner of his apartment. Uh, now, at first, I was like totally bummed about this lack of progress whenever I started thinking about it. I started talking to friends, and I was like, man, this just like kind of sucks when you think about it this way. And they're like, just think about it a different way. And I'm like, Good call, let's think about it a different way. So then I realized, maybe this isn't something to be sad about. Maybe I just nailed it. You know, there's like no point in changing it if things are kind of working out. So I'm happy to report, like after 15 years, things are mostly still the same, and I've gotten pretty good at a lot of it. You know, time and practice, they really do seem to help. Except with websites. <laughs> They sort of like separate themselves from all the other kinds of projects that I do in a pretty peculiar way. I don't really feel much better making them after 20 years. So my knowledge and skills, they tend to develop a little bit. Then things change, and then half of what I know just becomes like baggage. It gets phased out, it becomes dead weight, and I have to like unlearn a lot of things. This doesn't really happen with any of the other work that I do. I still know how to draw, I still know how to typeset stuff. It's just the web stuff that is different. The cycle, it, it happens with such regularity. I wonder if I actually have 20 years of experience or if it's really five years of experience repeated four times. So if you've been doing this for a while, please tell me this sounds familiar to you. So let me give you an example of these five-year cycles, OK? Now, as I said, I made my first website 20 years ago. Uh, I know it was exactly 20 years ago because I was a teenager and I was doing the Lord's work. I was sitting in my room transcribing the lyrics to Radiohead's OK Computer um, because I thought this was something that the world needed. Couldn't get anywhere else. It's like, I'm going to do this, and we're going to make a website. Uh, this record was released in 1997. I was learning HTML. And uh, working on the site, there was like one thing that just really confused me. How the hell do you put two things next to each other? People are snickering because like 20 years later, we still haven't fucking figured this out. <laughs> okay, so back in 97, we used tables and spacer GIFs. Um, I was really into this and I found it super interesting and I was willing to teach myself it. It's sort of like designing a website in a spreadsheet from hell. And who knows why I found this process fun. Maybe just back then I was like excited by the idea of like cobbling something together in my bedroom and then pushing a button and it would just be out there for the world to see. About five years later, we decided, you know what? Yeah, no, fuck that table stuff. Uh, we're going to go over to the CSS thing because the tables, they're not semantic, right? And fair enough. Um, when I was writing this talk, I kind of like looked at myself and realized that I've probably spent about 200 hours of my life trying to learn how to clear a float. I just type clear both and then like say, like cross my fingers and say a little prayer and hope that it works out. And it's just 50-50 odds at this point for me. That's why my ass was saved about five years later, whenever Flexbox came along. And I love Flexbox, it's my baby. Um, because I was trained as a print designer, so with Flexbox, I just like write three or four lines of CSS, and then magically I have two columns of text, and they're lined up by their baseline. I only had to wait 10 years for this. 
So, thank God. And then now, we have grid. Um, this is pretty much just taking responsive design and somehow making it more confusing. And I don't know, I'm, I'm a little grumpy about it, but after I had somebody explain it in more detail to me, I sort of warmed up to the idea because it's a big improvement in like how we control layout on the web. But it is a little bit spooky to sit down and look at the details of it and learn more about grid because every time I see a diagram explaining CSS grid, I start having flashbacks. I'm like reminded of those fucking table layouts I was doing in 1997. So there's this voice in the back of my head saying, not only do I need to learn a new way to put two things beside each other every five years, but now we're like stuck in this loop and it's starting over. You know, we've like completed a lap on this cycle and we're back at the table mode again. And then five years from now, another approach is gonna come along. It's probably gonna resemble floats. And then not knowing how to clear a float is gonna bite me in the ass for the second time in my career. Now, there's similar cycles in a bunch of other ways of making websites. You know, I just like chose one little thing that has a lot of influence on what I do as a designer making websites. Nothing stays settled, so of course, like somebody with one year of experience is going to be just as confused as somebody with 15 years of experience. You know, the things that are so often only understood by people who are in the middle of the current wave of thought. Um, so if you're before that sweet spot, your inexperience means that you're confused and you don't know a lot, right? Nothing wrong with that. If you're after that sweet spot, after that wave, you'll know lots of things. They just won't be very helpful. Uh, and they're not very applicable to like, that particular way of doing things. And I'm not saying this to say that, like, oh, old people don't know anything and young people don't know anything. I'm simply saying if you stick around long enough, you'll get to feel all three of these things. Now, there's one argument that says, Change is good, right? It's rigorous, it's healthy, um, and I agree, right? Keeping things in play, it helps us more easily fix what's wrong, and it'd be terrible and boring if everything stayed the same. But I also agree with the other argument that says change is exhausting. You know, people only have so much patience. So if this cycle exists, how many laps around the cycle can a person run? I'm on lap five right now, and I can tell you that it's pretty exhausting to engage with rehashed ideas from the past without feeling a tiny amount of prejudice against them. So methods that were once taboo are now back on the table. So for instance, a couple weeks ago, I was reading a post about the benefits of not using style sheets at all, and instead having inline styles for everything. And the post, it made a few compelling points, but the approach it would have been like absolute crazy talk a couple years ago. So much of the work that we do in building websites and software is about how we think. So the churn of tools and methods and these abstract concepts, it's also the churn of ideology because to successfully use those tools, you need to start thinking in a way similar to the people who made them. So swings and working methods they're exhausting because it's not as simple as like putting down a screwdriver and picking up a wrench. You also need to change how you think. You need to change your mind. That means experience, it creates like two distinct struggles as far as I can tell. So the first is to identify and unlearn what's no longer necessary. And I think it's important to say that that unlearning process is work. The second is to remain open-minded, patient, and willing to engage with what's new, even if it resembles a new take on something you decided against a long time ago. So that spirit of willingness, that's what was in me when I was starting to investigate everything that has changed in the last three or four years about making websites. And I began with the best of intentions, but the more I learned, the grumpier I got. <laughs> Because it seemed that a lot of the new stuff, it was like setting up these elaborate systems to automate parts of the work. But setting up the system and maintaining it, it just seemed like more effort for an experienced person than just doing the work without it. The new methods, they were invented to manage a level of complexity that is like completely foreign to me and my work. And it was easy for me to back away from all of that new stuff when I realized that I have alternate ways of managing that complexity in my projects. 
So instead of changing tools or changing my workflow, I changed the design. Sort of like designing a house so it's easy to build instead of inventing new kinds of cranes. So the cranes may be nice for skyscrapers, but you don't need them if you're not building skyscrapers. Uh, so the sites that I build, they need to clearly communicate and help users do pretty simple things. So like get people to watch a diverse portfolio of films or have people understand and try new software or make a website that feels musical and gets people to read a couple thousand words about B.B. King, for instance. So directness is best in my experience, and a great photo, a memorable illustration, or like a pitch-perfect sentence, it does most of the work. And beyond that, like fancy implementation, it's like never really moved the needle very much for my clients. It doesn't save me much time, and it doesn't make the work more distinctful or more useful for my clients. So my web design philosophy is no razzle-dazzle, which makes it kind of weird to come to a place like awards where there's a lot of razzle-dazzle. That has its place, it's just doesn't take up, it's not part of my practice at all. My job is to help my clients directly say the one or two uniquely true things about what they're doing, and then to try to enhance it with a memorable design that uses a light touch. So if complexity comes along, uh, we focus on it, we look for patterns, and we change the blueprint for what we're building. Uh, we don't necessarily go looking for better tools or fancier processes. In the past, I've called this like following the grain of the web. You just sort of go with what your tools make easy for you to do. So you make design choices that swing with what HTML and CSS and screens make easy for you. And each year that goes by, I sort of feel like there are fewer and fewer notable websites with this approach. So I thought it would be useful just to sort of show up and remind everyone that the easiest and cheapest strategy for dealing with complexity is to not invent something new to manage it, but just to avoid it altogether. I thought I would do a small test just to see how much complexity comes along with my very limited needs. So I wrote down the technical requirements of my web design process. It's not a long list. It's this stuff, so it's simple, responsive layout. It's web fonts and nicely set text. It's performant, scalable images. It's not a very long list. This is pretty basic stuff, you know. It's been pretty easy to do for the last five to eight years. Uh, but the complexity of these like, very fundamental needs has sort of ballooned uh, very recently. For instance, like when it comes to layout, I just showed you like four different methods to put two things next to one another. And each new method sort of nullifies the last one. So I hope we're reaching a stabilization point with that stuff. But you, know, you never know. Who knows what will come out five years from now. And when it comes to web fonts, you know, I thought it was just at font face. But this is a 90-page ebook published by A Book Apart. Um, apparently, it's not straightforward. And I'm sure that this is necessary, because like, why would anybody take the time to write 90 pages about this if it wasn't important? And then there's SVG when it comes to images, right? So even images are now complicated. Um, so vector images that get served up as SVG, but if you dig deep into it, I start to go a little cross-eyed, because an SVG is like a web page embedded inside of your web page. When it comes to raster images, like people are popping up full services to serve the right image to the right device. They figure you'd rather spend money than to try to figure it out for yourself. And they're right, because now suddenly serving an image is as complicated as serving a video. My point is not to say that these things are problems. It's just to say that the foundations are now sufficiently complicated enough on their own so you need very good reasons to add more optional complexity on top of it. And I've kept my examples to like the most basic of web implementations. You know, I haven't really touched on things like JavaScript or animation or libraries or preprocessors or frameworks or package managers or automation or testing or deployment. Haven't touched any of that. And all of this together is like sort of absolutely inscrutable from the outside. Like it's very difficult to understand somebody else's system. You know, last month I started a new project and I had to install a package manager to install a package manager. And that's sort of when I closed my laptop and just like slowly backed away from it because I knew something was wrong. 
I got started learning CSS in this place called like the CSS Zen Garden. And this is like, well, it's just a lot different than that, isn't it? <laughs> so if you go talk to like a senior software developer, somebody old and with a gristly neck beard, you know, somebody who's been around the block a few times, you'll probably hear them complain about spaghetti code. Uh, this is when code is overwrought, it's unorganized, it's opaque, it's like snarled up with these dependencies. And I perked up whenever I heard that term used for the first time because I'm a designer and I can't really identify spaghetti code, but I sure as hell know about spaghetti workflows and spaghetti tool chains. And it feels like we're sort of really close to that now on the web. And that breaks my heart because so much of my start on the web came from being able to see and easily make sense of other people's work. We had view source. And each year that goes by, view source becomes a less and less helpful. You know, markup, it balloons in size and becomes illegible because computers are generating it without an eye for context. Styles, they become overly verbose and redundant. Functionality gets obfuscated behind compressed JavaScript. It's just really difficult to read. And that situation is sort of annoying to me because my thoughts, they go to that young designer I brought up at the start of my talk. So how many opportunities did I have when I was first starting out to reproduce what I saw by having legible examples in front of me? And how detrimental is it to have that kind of information obfuscated for her? So before the websites could explain themselves, now somebody needs to walk you through it. Illegibility comes from complexity without clarity. And I think the legibility of the source is one of the most important properties of the web. It's the main thing that keeps the door open to independent, unmediated contributions to the network. So if you can write markup, you don't need Medium or Twitter or Instagram, though they're really nice to have. And the best way to help somebody write markup is to make sure that they can read markup. I wonder what young designers think of this situation and how they're educating themselves in this current environment. You know, like how do they learn if the code is illegible? Um, and does it seem more experienced people are sort of pulling up the ladder? 20 years ago, I decided to make my own website and like push out these completely unnecessary transcriptions of Radiohead lyrics because I saw an example of HTML and I could read it. Now, many of my design peers that are about my age are exactly the same. You know, we possessed the skills to make websites, but we stopped there. We stuck with markup and like never progressed into full-on programming because we were only willing to go as far as things were legible. So the crisis of illegibility, I think, is also one of finding clear explanations and examples. And that crisis, it comes back each time that cycle restarts with a new method that needs to be learned. And this dilemma, it's not just for people with one year of experience or people with 15 years of experience. It eventually will hit all of us whenever something new comes around. So if the web is always changing and knowledge deteriorates quickly, I think it's worthwhile to develop a solid personal philosophy towards change and learning. Now, Silicon Valley has tried to provide a few of these. All of them are about speed. Uh, this one's probably the most famous. It comes from Facebook, move fast and break things. Um, you see this come up a lot in conference talks, and I think it's been thrown under the bus enough times by now. Generally, people don't like this, and they understand how it's foolish. But I'm also sort of curious why people are so unwilling to commit to the opposite of it. Nobody ever really goes far enough and says, move slow and fix things. That's interesting to me. Um, let me show you a video about speed. I'm going to plug this in so you can hear people yelling. There we go. Rabbit's just chilling, man. 
So I have watched this damn thing enough times to like overthink it because I find it like, there's somebody out there who was like, you know what, fuck it, let's test it. Let's like settle this once and for all, let's like really do it. And it's true, you know? This is like my favorite thing that I found on the internet the last couple months. And I've watched it enough times to just completely overthink it. You know, like the rabbit, it doesn't lose because it gets tired. Like that's what the original story is about. It doesn't lose because it gets tired. It, gets, it loses because it gets confused about which direction to go. You know, so you heard the audio. The rabbit just sort of stops, and then there's just a crowd of people around it yelling things at it that it doesn't really understand. That feels a lot like Twitter to me, actually. <laughs> so the rabbit loses because like, it just doesn't know where to go. And it really pains me to say this, but like, as somebody with decades of experience like making things for the web, uh, I want to be more like the tortoise, you know? I want to be more diligent, I want to be more direct and purposeful, and Berlin excluded, like, never too far from home. I think there's a lot of sort of um, mixed feelings about the web at this point, and probably what we're feeling is that the web needs pockets of slowness and thoughtfulness as its power and its reach continues to increase. So I think we need to create space for complexity's important sibling nuance. And spaces without nuance, they tend to gravitate towards stupidity. And as an American, I think I can tell you there's no limits to the amount of damage that can be inflicted by stupidity and speed. Uh, the web, it also needs diligent people, so that our idea of what the web is and what it does remains legible to everybody. And this applies to the systems and the social environments that the web creates, but I think it can also work at a more humble level. I think it also applies to things like writing legible code and making design systems that are easy to interpret because they're elegant. All this stuff has a place too. And I think it's by keeping our work legible that we keep the door open to the next generation of our coworkers. What works for them also works for us because whether you're just out of school or if you've been doing this for decades, you'll eventually end up in the same spot, which is your first year of making websites. Thanks. <laughs>